I think my first 10 days in Normandy, I loved every minute of it. I feel that a lot of the soldiers hid their fear because they didn't want to be shown up as cowards. Waves and, and waves and waves of bombers coming forward. Like a dark cloud, terrible roaring, you know, you can't hear It was a terrible occasion and it's, it's a memory which I do not think about any more than I can help. You lived in a family, you saw some of them die being incinerated and when you got out of the tank at night, you could be shivering with the exhaustion of it. And then there were men in extremis and all around the tents, you just hear this little, oh dear. On D-Day, more than 150,000 Allied troops had landed in France. The operation succeeded mainly because the invaders achieved surprise. The Germans were expecting landings where the channel is narrow. In Normandy, German defences were relatively thin. But the advance lacked the punch of the assault on the beaches. None of the D-Day objectives inland was taken. Outside Caen, British troops were stopped by the only German armoured division in the invasion area. The British Army's main objective on D-Day was Caen. And that they didn't take it on D-Day was hardly a disaster, but the timetable, speed, did matter. For with every day after the landings, new German armoured divisions were reaching the battlefield. And that meant that objectives that could have been lightly taken early on, with very few casualties, later involved massive battles and heavy losses. Losses not only among Allied troops, but also among the French. André Heitz, aged 18 and a student, was in the French resistance spying on the Germans. When Caen was bombed, on and after D-Day, he became a stretcher bearer. We immediately guessed what was happening, because after midnight we began hearing bombings outside the city, and then after two o'clock it was a continuous rumbling all along the coast over there, and soon the sky became a red glow, and then late in the morning bombings went on again, well, the most damaged area was on that side, what you call the uh, Saint-Jean district, the Quartier Saint-Jean, because the church over there was one of the very first places hit. It set fire to the whole district. The fire spread and spread, and it burned for 11 days. How many Germans were there in the town on the night of D-Day? Well, only 300 because the infantry division that had its headquarters here had its soldiers spread all the way along the coast, yeah. uh, which covered more or less what the, um, well, the place so where the British landed. all this bombing, and you had about five, four or five raids altogether, not to mention the bombardment from the sea, yeah. all this bombing was killing a lot of French people, not many Germans. Exactly. Yes, I'm afraid so. On June the 7th, D plus one, the Germans defeated a second attempt to capture Caen. Captain Alistair Bannerman was ordered to take five anti-tank guns to Lebesay Wood, three miles short of the city, on the assumption that the wood had been taken. It hadn't. We suddenly came into the village of Lebesay, which was all rubble, and to my horror, uh, instead of the grey, instead of the khaki uniforms of our own troops, here were these grey-green soldiers rushing around and I realized that we were slap bang in the middle of the Germans. With some of his men, Bannerman was taken prisoner. Days later, his wife received her first news of him. In the middle of eating treacle pudding, the telephone rang and I went to answer it. And it was our postmaster. We were a very, very close community in those days here something that never has happened since. And he said, Mrs. Bannerman, I couldn't. I just could not send you a telegram. Whereat, of course, my, my heart sank right down. He said, I had to ring up and tell you yourself that I have now been informed that your husband is missing. Then we came on this very um unpleasant, vicious-looking lot of young men, I have to say, teenagers they looked almost, uh, the Hitler Jugend SS Panzer Division lined up, ready to support the 21st. 
and they were a very different kettle of fish to the to the panzers, uh, to the twenty first, and they sort of spat at us and called us names and mocking, mocked and all the rest of it, and I thought, well, thank God I wasn't captured by them. Ohne Unterschied des Alters und des Geschlechtes, der Herkunft und des Berufes steht das deutsche Volk im totalen Kriegseinsatz. 12th SS Panzer had been raised in 1943 from the ranks of the Hitler Youth. It had never been in battle, but it was to prove itself to be one of the most formidable German units in Normandy. Some of its soldiers were only 16. They'd marched and drilled and learned to obey since they were 12. Corporal Heino Fopel had volunteered for the SS as a 16-year-old, straight from school. As a youngster, were you excited by all that stuff? By the Nazis? Yeah. I must say, yes. I didn't know anything else. In 1933, when Hitler came to power, I was eight years old. Then came the marching and the singing and the carrying flags. That was in the Jungfolk, and later the Hitler Youth, and all that propaganda which I only fully understood 20 years later. Everybody was taught blind obedience, and knew nothing else. A hundred thousand, ten, twenty million learnt nothing else, just blind obedience. One day, a German officer, very sort of scented and pomaded type Nazi, um, came round to us and said, would anybody like to send a message to their loved ones? And everybody said, oh, no, you mustn't do that. It's, it's German propaganda. I said, well, if my wife can't listen to a, a German radio without becoming a Nazi at this stage of the war, uh, heaven help us. So I'm, of course I'm going to give my uh, a message and, and relieve her mind, because she won't know whether I'm dead or what. Bannerman's message that he was a prisoner of war reached his wife by a roundabout route. A crofter in Scotland heard the German broadcast and wrote her a letter. That was the end of my agony for me. For me, I was one of the lucky ones. And there were so, so many who weren't. So I shall never, never, never forget to give thanks for that. At the western end of the British sector, German defences were significantly weaker. And on June the 9th, the High Command decided to go for a gap in the German line. But it was three days before the attack began. By then, two more German armoured divisions were arriving at the battlefield. All went well until British tanks, virtually unopposed, took a hilltop town called Villers-Bocage, only to be ambushed while parked at the side of a street. A single German Tiger tank knocked out a long line of British armoured vehicles before reversing away to join several other Tigers in battle just up the road. By the end of the day, four German tanks had been destroyed, but the British had lost 50 armoured vehicles. It was here on the edge of Villers-Bocage that a single German tank commander was able to stop the British armoured division in its tracks. It wasn't a major defeat, merely a setback. And if the British corps commander had reinforced the position, he would almost certainly have regained it. As it was, he withdrew his armour several miles and threw away the chance of breaking through the German lines. That hasty decision to abandon the offensive led to weeks of slow, hard fighting in the Bocage, a checkerboard of narrow sunken lanes, small fields enclosed by high hedgerows and dense woodland. For the enemy it was ideal defensive country and they used it well. For the Allies it was a death trap, above all for tanks. The hedgerows were centuries old. Their roots had bound the banks into barriers not even a bulldozer could break down. The Normandy Bocage meant advancing a few yards at a time. There'd be a sudden ambush, a burst of fire then close quarters fighting with a hidden enemy well dug in and camouflaged. Fifty years later, it is still a mystery why highly trained tank crews were never warned about the Bocage. 
time and time again we would hit something a bit wider than this and the tank would crash down and then the, you know we had two 360 horsepower engines so the driver would really give it the gun full bore both engines and roar up this other side of course all your belly plates were then exposed to the enemy and it would crash down on the other side what was so depressing was 50 yards ahead was another bank and for all you knew there could be a, another lane just like this yeah, but this, this, this was fun. really a, a tank driver's nightmare here these, these sort of banks mm. Reg, was there anywhere in Britain where you could train um, in countryside like this? Did you? No, no. Uh, most of our training, uh, tank training, was uh, done in Thetford, uh, which is uh, uh, north of uh, um, countryside, which was flat country, right? Much the same as we, we, which we, we would meet in, in Normandy, but nothing uh, to the extent of sunken roads and big ditches as we encountered here. Yeah. Going down a sunken road, with high walls either side, uh, impenetrable walls, gives you a lot of problems when you're commanding a tank. Uh, your field of view is very limited across this. An added danger, of course, was the German infantry with their Panzerfaust, uh, which were a handheld thing rather like our bazooka, could do tremendous damage to a tank at short range. Reg Cox, Alistair Morrison and Trooper Roy Willits had landed on D-Day after training together for three years. Reg Cox had been a cavalryman, following his father into the regiment. When I came over the age of 14, I thought, well, I'm no civilian. So I thought, well, I could, I, I, I might just as well join the 4th Central Order of Guards, because my father was in that unit. My brother and I were we were both born in the regiment. Um, he was three years younger than I, and he just wanted to follow his brother and his father's footsteps. Well, in the squadron, we were almost like a family. And if there were two chaps of the same name, you knew them as Cox 98 and Cox 96, but not so in A squadron. They were known as, which Cox do you mean, Bud or Reg? And Reg was the elder of the two, but both of them were PT fanatics, and they'd both been to the physical training centre at Aldershot and would wear these red and blue muscle men kits or rubber men kits. And they would often take the squadron PT, and they were really very popular mem uh, members of the society. The brothers had loaded in Southampton, sailing to France in separate tank landing ships berthed alongside one another. Before we disembarked, I spotted my brother from his landing craft and he signaled to me in arm semaphore, which we were taught. Good luck, Reg. I'll see you in Normandy. By the afternoon of D-Day, their tanks were four miles inland, passing through apparently peaceful countryside just south of the village of Creil. The leading tank stopped and a great gout of flame came out of its turret. One body jumped out, landed on the ground, and then a great black column of smoke climbed up about 200 feet in the air. When I was watching it, the other tank stopped and exactly the same thing happened. We had no idea until then that a Sherman could blow up in this way. One of A Squadron's tanks was being driven by Reg Cox's brother, Ron. A few days later, I, I took the opportunity to go back and find my brother's burnt-out tank. I've, in actual fact, I found that the, the armoured plating had been penetrated by an armoured plate, an armoured piercing shot. And beside the tank, 
to those three temporary graves. So I had to accept the fact that my brother had been killed. Up to then, you were doubtful? Up to then, yes, quite true. I was a bit doubtful about it. I couldn't accept it or believe that he had been killed. Reg was in the hall, the driver's seat. I was behind in the directory. Put my hand through and put, on, on, put my hand on his shoulder. And I said, Reg, I'm off. I'm so grieved. I'm awfully sorry that this has happened. And you know, you know, Reg was a, a very forthright and, and a, a very... He was a, a regimental boxer, as you, as you probably know. Very strong man and not very... Uh, what what should we say? Not easily easily disturbed, you know. Didn't didn't cry uh, to any extent, but that man sat in the driver's seat and sobbed. One by one, people got killed, and um, there was a lot on, and you didn't let yourself, you didn't, you blanked your mind, you didn't let yourself get involved uh, sentimentally with these people. So you could really take, with relative equanimity, the killing or seriously wounding of a really close friend? Yes. You had to. Otherwise? Well, you were lost. You could become sentimental and depressed, I suppose. Mm. But you, no one, everyone made a point of uh, taking this as a matter of fact, a matter of life and death. You didn't uh, sentimentalize about it at all. Two weeks after D-Day, the Allies were still confined to their bridgehead. The Americans, too, had taken none of their D-Day objectives and were struggling through the Bocage. Meanwhile, more enemy divisions were arriving at the battlefield. Ground was only slowly being gained, and the prospect of a quick breakthrough had faded. At this point, another setback struck the Allies. Needing a port within their bridgehead, the Allies had had to bring their own. Two prefabricated harbours, consisting of huge concrete caissons and floating piers, were built in England and towed across the Channel. When assembled, the Mulberries, their code name, would be nearly as big as the port of Dover. On June the 19th, D plus 13, a gale blew up. The American Mulberry was destroyed, the British badly damaged. 800 landing craft were wrecked or stranded on the beaches. Unloading of supplies and reinforcements stopped. It might have been worse. A gale a week earlier could have cost the Allies their foothold in Normandy. But as it was, a fourth attempt to take Caen had to be postponed. On June the 26th, General Montgomery launched a full-scale offensive against Caen and the open country to the south. He called it Operation Epsom. The main punch would be delivered by two infantry divisions, the 15th Scottish and the 43rd Wessex, and the 11th Armoured Division, a force of about 50,000 men and 500 tanks. The initial objectives were two rivers, the Odon and beyond it, the Orne. The Odon was the first river to cross. It wasn't very wide or very deep, but its steep banks made it impossible for tanks. On the 27th of June, 600 men of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders captured this bridge and another one about a mile downstream. They held the bridges while the 11th Armoured Division passed through. Then on the 29th, two German SS Panzer divisions arrived from Poland and attacked. The Argyles held on, but a far bigger battle was raging only three miles up the road. There, the ground sloped up to a ridge and a spot on the map called Hill 112. 
Over the next few weeks, Hill 112 became a graveyard, first for the Scots and later for the Wessex Division. I've got a feeling this edge is much thinner now. Well, it is. Yes, it is. I've got a feeling it's much thicker. Probably... Sergeants Jack Carr and Bill Partridge and Captain Basil Watts were in the 4th Battalion of Somerset Light Infantry. Yeah, about 100, 200 yards to the start line, we had more cover at that point, yes, that's and we true. came through here. Um, no cover except standing corn when we got out here, though. Well, that, well yes, yes, well, the corn was what raised high there. Yes, yes. Um, we moved through this second hedgerow. Tanks were on fire, and then suddenly everything seemed to explode. Um, the artillery and mortars were back much further back. On the reverse slope? On the reverse slope, yes. So you were the... being fired at, you were being mortared as well? Yes, yes, oh, yes. yes. Th those are the multi-barrel things that we and were mini, talking moaning about. Minis, right? Moaning minis, right? Moaning minis, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They had a devastating noise, a nasty sort of whirring siren to begin with, and then a wail. You could hear the moaning minis coming over and the platoon went down in the corn and when we got up again one section which was about eight or nine men only one man stood up so there was eight casualties right away from just that one incident so when we got to the top there weren't very many of us left in fact the corn was very high quite waist high and amongst the corn they cut lanes both horizontally and vertical and if you got in those lanes invariably you were sniped at so how many men did you lose, do you reckon, between here, where we're standing, and there, the top of the ridge? My particular platoon, which would have started off about 29th to 30, um, I finished up with about nine. But... To get some idea of it, um, the reinforcements that we had after this was over came to something like, um, I don't think, about 19 officers and getting on for 400 other ranks. Could you stop to help the wounded or not? No. No no no, 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 no. That was part of our training and well understood by everybody concerned that once the attack had started, anyone who was wounded um, just had to be left and you continued the advance. Once again, the timetable was crucial. The delay caused by the storm had allowed the Germans to bring up another two SS Panzer divisions from Poland. Captain Wilfried Schwarz of the 9th SS Panzer ended up on the crest of Hill 112, looking down at the British. We had a good view over the fields towards Kham, and the edge of the city. It was a good observation point with a wide field of fire. The English should have made better use of the ground. They should have kept their heads down, moving in short bursts, taking cover again, then firing from a prone position, or on their knees, but not standing up in the open, so we could identify their leaders and officers. The attack on Hill 112 had reduced the Somersets to 50% of their strength. They were then ordered to make a night attack. The idea was that at one o'clock in the morning we would move forward, infiltrate the enemy positions before they were awake. Well, this didn't seem feasible because I was quite certain that they were as wide awake as we were. And as we m moved forward, unfortunately, the, the guns of our own artillery behind us, which were firing on other targets, silhouetted us so they could obviously um, see us coming. Unfortunately, one of our lads was carrying a um, grenade, uh, a phosphorus grenade in his pouch, and he got hit on some barbed wire. He got strangled on this barbed wire, and of course his screams completely gave the game away, with the, the enemy really let go. The phosphorus exploded and he was a mass of flames. And he was calling out for us to be, shoot me, please shoot me. And um, there was a shot and he was quiet. So someone had, had mercifully um, put him out of his agonies. It was a terrible occasion, and it's, it's, it's something which I know all who witnessed it have had to live with that, I think, over the years. It, it, it's something which still troubles me, even now, all these years afterwards. It's a, a memory which I 
do not think about any more than I can help. It was, I think others would say probably the worst night of their lives or one of the worst nights of their lives, that particular night attack. Operation Epsom gained no significant ground. Among the infantry, one man in four was killed or wounded. Today, there is nothing to show that this was once a battlefield. And then, almost hidden at the end of some village, you'll come across one of the 21 Allied cemeteries in Normandy. At some of you, only the dates on the gravestones and the names of the regiments from Scotland and the west of England will tell you that the battle called Epsom was fought near here. The names of all those buried here are in this book. David McDermid, Fusilier, the 6th Battalion, the Royal Scots Fusiliers, killed on the 29th of June 1944, aged 22, son of Hugh and Agnes McDermid of Melrose, Roxburghshire. David McDermott must have been killed in what later became known as the Scottish Corridor. Others in this cemetery were killed at Gavras Bridge on Hill 112 elsewhere. The Scottish Division alone suffered more than 2,000 casualties in four days. Most of them were infantry. As in World War I, so it was in Normandy. By June the 30th, the British and Canadians had suffered 24,700 killed, wounded and missing since D-Day. American losses were higher, 34,000. German casualties were over 80,000. As we came in there that night, we saw them being carried out of the ambulances and into the wards. The wards we could see were absolutely full. There were all ranks in there, brigadiers, bombardiers, corporals, captains. And they all just said the same thing, which was really very pathetic. They just said a little, Oh dear, there were men in extremis, and all around the tents, the round the canvas walls of the tent, you just hear this little, oh dear. And there were sudden influxes, it would come in a rush at a time, of uh, perhaps 20 or 30 wounded would come in a convoy together. And amongst them were Germans, and I remember two Germans were brought through to where I was operating, the first one struggling and screaming. Uh, and I understood and spoke German and realized he thought he was being taken to be executed. And so I went to him and I told him in German that although he was an enemy, he was a wounded man, and we were non-combatants, and our job was to look after the wounded, and he would be properly treated. And then he calmed down and accepted the anesthetic. Meanwhile, at the eastern end of the bridgehead, the airborne troops, who had landed just after midnight on D-Day, were holding the high ground east of the River Orne against repeated German counterattacks. They'd been in virtually continuous action for three weeks. For the 3rd Parachute Brigade, the Chateau Saint-Caen is a place of pilgrimage. We were told at the offset, it must be held regardless of the cost in men and material. No way could we vacate this hill. As a trained soldier, but untried in battle, I think my first 10 days in Normandy, I loved every minute of it. Every minute, it was, it was wonderful, exciting. It was, it was um, like being at a fair and shooting at targets that were presented before you. Uh, it didn't cost me anything. The gun was supplied, the ammunition was supplied, and I really enjoyed it. But, Later on in Normandy, when you began to get a little more wise and you'd seen horrific injuries to some of your friends, you began to realise that war wasn't all fun, you could get hurt. Lieutenant Colonel Terence Otway, commanding the 9th Parachute Battalion, had lost more than half his men early on D-Day. Now his original 700 were down to 150. Behind me, there were 50-odd temporary graves, and I 
ended up by losing 120 killed here, I think, from memory, plus wounded. It was very, very hurtful to see these. <coughs> Hurts now, sorry. Uh. <coughs> to see these young men, 19, 18 years old, mm. falling alongside one, mm. uh, in front of one. Mm. Yes, it hurt. And how did the troops take it, watching their mates getting killed? Well, if they felt it, they didn't show it. They were better than I was, much better. They, uh, well, they were marvellous. Uh, but I'm quite sure that underneath they felt just as badly as I did. Mm. The one thing that was um, frightening, devastating, were the German mortars, the 100 millimeter mortars, because you could have 20, 30 men in an area have just one salvo of bombs coming, perhaps six or eight bombs, and virtually wipe you out. It didn't seem as though there was ever a piece of shrapnel wasted from a mortar bomb. Because if it didn't get you 10 feet away, it got you 20 feet or 30 feet, because the trajectory of the shrapnel was so flat and low. They were devastating, terrifying things. A month after D-Day, following four abortive attempts to capture Caen, Montgomery resorted to new and more drastic tactics. 450 heavy RAF bombers were to blast German positions outside the city, paving the way for infantry. But to avoid hitting British and Canadian troops, the bomb line was moved northward into the city itself, beyond the German positions. Now, grey and purple smoke is billowing up from the Khan area. The results of this visual bombing attack are really terrific. Hundreds upon hundreds of pounds of bombs are raining down on this stricken town. And still the bombers come pouring in. There seems to be no end to them. The whole target area is a seething mass of smoke. It looked like a city that had, that had been murdered, massacred. It looked like a city that was completely devastated. You couldn't recognize anything. The buildings were blown to bits. Even the French people themselves would never have known it. The most memory I have was the smell of dust and death. And to this day, I sometimes can still smell death. The roads were completely blocked. Uh, of course, we had bulldozers at work from the moment we entered, trying to drive away through under German fire. And while the planes were dropping the bombs, three slid right down the stairs to this underground shelter and killed everybody that was in that shelter. All I could see was heads and bodies and legs and pieces of human beings. French or German? French. I hadn't seen anyone. I feel that uh, the planes had done a wasted job. There were no public air raid shelters for the people of Caen. As their ancient city began to collapse around them, they took refuge in the 11th century Abbey of saint Etienne. So how many people were living in this church all those weeks? Well, more than a thousand. And all together with the abbey buildings next door and the improvised hospital behind, there must have been about 10,000 refugees uh, hiding and surviving in, in here. The lucky ones that could rescue a mattress brought it into the church. Straw was brought later on so that everybody could sleep in the church. They trusted those walls which are so th thick, I'm yeah. sure, more than six feet thick, and also those heavy pillars. And there was a, some sort of superstition attached to it, because you know that William the Conqueror is buried here, and they thought that the British would never dare uh, destroy the grave of one of their kings. To this day, nobody knows how many French people were killed in the bombing of Caen. According to one estimate, it was 10,000. André Heinz says it was probably nearer 6,000. My own feeling about the bombing was that it was really unnecessary. I felt that it was an act of sheer frustration 
uh, on the part of, of, of the higher command, that there we had been for weeks, hammering away on the outskirts and failing to penetrate the, the, the defences. And we had this great air weapon, which could, in, in the last resort, be used. Brigadier Charles Richardson was Montgomery's senior planner and in charge of liaison with the Air Force. We actually watched the bombing from about a mile away. And it was, of course, a most staggering sight. So was the bombing a success? No, it wasn't. Because uh, the attacking troops, particularly the, uh, the vehicles, the tanks and, the, and uh, infantry vehicles, had grave difficulties in getting forward. The casualties of the Germans were insignificant. The, the wreckage to Kong was, of course, considerable. And I've since learnt, of course, that uh, desperate scenes went on inside with civilians. So uh, it could not be called a success. The lack of spectacular progress was causing concern in high places. Several British generals, judged to be overcautious, had been earmarked for the sack. Churchill and a number of senior Americans were voicing doubts about Montgomery. As for the troops, engaged as they were in one seemingly futile battle after another, Normandy was beginning to resemble their father's accounts of fighting in the First World War. I feel that a lot of the soldiers hid their fear because they didn't want to be known or shown up as cowards. And although there were many that had gone bomb happy, I felt this could be me. The body can only take so much and it's bound to crack eventually. And that was the way I felt. How long am I going to go on like this? How much more can I take? I could be a nervous wreck for the rest of my life. Now, what you could not say was that you were afraid. This is absolutely forbidden. There was something about the British upper lip, tight upper lip. You did not say you were afraid. So you didn't have that release. But we talked about all kinds of stupid things, and we would say, well, why don't we all go bomb happy? Why don't we all get out of our tanks and go down to the beach and get on a boat and go home? I was sent for a short time, only a few days, to a special unit that had been set up to deal with self-inflicted wounds. I dealt with the surgery and no court martials. I think anyone who suffered a wound of hand or foot not inflicted by the enemy or not by one of his comrades letting a gun off was automatically sent there and put on court, mar on court martial for self-inflicted injury. And I found this very distressing and all of them terribly worried about the fact that they were going to go to a court martial and I could give them no reassurance at all. As infantry casualties mounted, Montgomery decided to use his massive reserves of tanks. His next offensive, Operation Goodwood, was an attempt to take the high ground south of Caen. It was misconceived. Three British armoured divisions with 8,000 vehicles were to cross the River Orne, assemble in the cramped airborne bridgehead, and pick their way through British minefields, all before meeting the enemy. Inevitably, the Germans saw them coming. Helmut Krebs, a grounded Luftwaffe lieutenant, says he'll never forget the 2,000 bomber raid that preceded the attack. It was the heaviest German troops in the field had ever encountered. I think it was uh, 10 minutes to 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, <clears throat> we heard uh, drumbling and rumbling in the northwest part of uh, Caen waves and waves and waves of bombers coming forward all over us like a dark cloud the bombers came along and it's a terrible roaring you know you can't hear anything else also these bombers i couldn't see the sun even the sun you know and then you saw uh steel helmet with the head of a soldier in it. It's uh, bursting and it's rolling to the side. Well, terrible sight, you know, terrible sight. What was the effect on the German troops of this bombing? Yes, uh, you must know that 
our division, special our regiment, was vanished. Vanished. Was uh, uh, nearly everybody was dead. All the soldiers died. For the first two hours, the leading British division, the 11th Armoured, made good progress. But the tip of the British spearhead was out on a limb. The other two tank divisions were locked, nose to tail, in a vast traffic jam, hemmed in by the British minefields. Without support, 11th Armoured's tanks were at the mercy of the enemy's multi-purpose 88mm guns. A Panzer Division colonel, Hans von Luck, now requisitioned a battery of 88s. I ran over to the, to the co commandant of this battery, it was a young lieutenant, and said, do you know what's happened there? He said, no. I said, you are already bypassed by British tanks. And uh, then I said, you will go to fight the tanks. He said, no, I'm Air Force. <laughs> my job are the bombers, your yeah. job are the tanks down yeah. there. Yeah. So I took my little pistol and said, you will be a dead man immediately or get a high decoration. So he decided for the high decoration. So I put these four guns in the big apple orchard, this disappeared now, and said, come on, fire up your four guns and they uh, get them from the flank. Within second, they had killed about 25 tanks. 25 British tanks? Yeah. And they, they were burning around here. Mm. And uh, then I said to him, I will help you with one battery of Major Becker, mm -hmm. who was in position in this little village over there. Mm -hmm. How many tanks did the British lose in that battle altogether? Altogether, 450 tanks. 450? In two days. General Montgomery, as was his habit, pronounced the battle a complete success. In Britain, newspapers announced a breakout. It was nothing of the kind. In two days, the British Army in France lost more than a third of its armour. And far worse, together with the Canadians, lost 7,000 men. Caen had finally fallen but the city was no longer of any strategic value. What we heard, first of all, was this marvellous piece of uh, news from the BBC, to which we were able to tune on our wirelesses, that the way was open to Paris, a great victory had been won. We were exhilarated. We'd only had a small part in it, but this was wonderful news, piece by Christmas. And then we learned from our friends in the second North Ant Yeomanry that it had indeed been a catastrophe uh, many of our friends who had joined up with older members of the yeomanry had died. The regiment had almost been wiped out. Goodwood also exposed the inferior design of the Allies' mass-produced tanks. The Sherman, uh, mechanically reliable as it was, had one very nasty habit, and that was a propensity to burst into flames the moment it was hit. It very readily ignited. Um, it became something of a joke in the German army who christened them Tommy Cookers with a macabre sense of humour. And secondly, the 75mm gun with which we were issued, uh, although a great improvement on the two-pounder which we'd had previously, was still not capable of penetrating the armour of the heavier German tanks like the Tiger and the Panther. I can remember having a Tiger in our sights quite clear and unmistakable silhouette of the Tiger. And we fired an armor-piercing shot, uh, which is the right treatment to give a Tiger. The range was no more than about 600 yards, uh, which is close in terms of tank warfare. And we could see the tracer bullet leave our gun. And it struck on the front corner of the Tiger's turret. And then to our horror, I saw this tracer bullet turn 90 degrees and shoots straight off up into the sky. It had ricocheted right off the front of this turret. The turret of the German tank began to swing towards us and we got out of the way. The shot came all right, but it missed us or else I wouldn't be sitting here talking because the Germans used their 88 millimeter gun on a Tiger tank and that 88 millimeter would go through the armor plating of a Sherman like a knife through butter. Nevertheless, the stalemate on the British front was serving Montgomery's larger purpose. 
By holding down seven out of eight German panzer divisions in Normandy, the British were engaging Hitler's finest troops in a relentless war of attrition. That enabled the Americans to achieve the long-awaited breakout. On June the 27th, American troops had captured Cherbourg. Three weeks later, they took the town of Saint-Lô. By the end of July, they'd taken the entire Cherbourg Peninsula. That set the stage for the breakout that would trap the bulk of the German army in France between the two Allied armies. Setting the upper and lower jaws of the trap took another two weeks. The Americans raced to form the lower jaw. The Canadians, British and Poles forced their way down from the north. That left a gap of 12 miles through which the Germans could escape. As the ground troops closed into the kill, and the valley became choked with retreating German columns, Allied aircraft took a terrible toll on men and horses and machines. Then I thought, are you going to get out of this mess? Or should you just try to desert? But I was too scared, because in Russia there had been counter-offensives, and that's when they caught those who had deserted to the Russians. And then they had such people again snapped, who were running to the Russians. The advancing Germans, those on the offensive, shot all of them because they were deserters. Shot them, yes. So our crew was talking about it. I thought if we start an offensive and they get us, we're as good as dead. The German commanders, nearly all of whom escaped from the carnage, had known that this would be the fate of their already depleted divisions. They had begged Hitler to agree to a fighting retreat to a new defense line on the River Seine. Hitler had refused. He'd ordered that every man must fight or die where he stood. Before the gap was finally closed by Polish and American troops, some 20,000 Germans got away. But they left behind them at Falaise 50,000 prisoners and 10,000 dead. For the Allies, the Battle of Normandy had finally gone according to plan. Four days later, the Americans and the French were in Paris. And a week after that, the British were in Brussels. And with that, some of us began to think that the war in Europe would be over by Christmas. But what we failed to take into account was the extraordinary ability of the German army to recover. So the fighting went on through Holland and Belgium and into Germany. And in those subsequent battles, after France, 128,000 Allied troops were killed. And God knows how many civilians. D-Day and the Battle of Normandy were only the beginning of the end.